Hello, Arnie. Hello, Paul. I hear that you've been assigned to create the marketing campaign for our newest Surefire hit video game, Fear Effect 2. Absolutely, Mike. And can I just say that we are thrilled to be able to work with Kronos. I mean, Cardinal Sin, that was the chef's kiss of 3D fighting games. Absolutely. Guy Fieri. Flavortown. All day. That's, uh, disturbing. Anyway, uh, go on. Alright, so everybody knows how awesome and successful the first Fear Effect game was. But we all know that there was one thing that it needed much more of. Yes, I always felt like we could have been more ambitious with our storytelling. Sexiness. Sexiness. I'm, I'm sorry? Alright, picture this. What if we had ads where Hannah was in her underwear? But what does that have to do with the actual game? Well, it'll show off how hot all the in-game models are. Our research shows that cell-shaded polygons are really in right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble understanding how this will make people want to play the game. Fair enough. Maybe you don't like underwear, that's understandable. But, not to worry, this is where we bring in Rain. What?! We would have Hannah and Rain, in their underwear, together. But it doesn't have anything to do with the gameplay, the plot, anything at all! Hmm. What if we had them holding guns? What is wrong with you two? Ooh, and the tagline could be, No one's surprised this story is capable of 13 climaxes. Oh, uh, just... Just get out. Get out. We won't let just you down, out. sir. You're get gonna out. love it. You're get gonna out. love it. Get out. Please leave. Hello everyone and welcome to the Region Free Gamers Podcast, the podcast fluent in gaming. I'm Mike Doucette, today I'll be your host on a ride through the games and times of Kronos Digital, a tale replete with adversity, triumph, and super janky early 3D fighters. So janky. <laughs> yeah, pretty jank. Uh, fortunately, I'm not alone. I am honored to be joined by first one, Arnaldo Perez, recent arcade cat prodigy and nonary game savant. That's How you doing, right. Arnie? What's up? Call Arnie? me call you call me the jank man because I'm <laughs> really loving these yeah. uh, games right here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, uh, recent graduate of Warrior University with honors, the true city guru Paul Jesus. Romalo. <laughs> Paul, how folked are we this morning? Extremely folked. <laughs> are Extremely. We, are we folked? Yeah. How many like... Santas did you assault uh, to? Uh, pass your final exam <laughs> i was i was run over with a thousand lawnmowers actually is, <laughs> yeah. is how i graduated yeah. and trampled by a stampede of elephants that's how i prepared for oh, this God. episode hulk hogan <laughs> hogan no my yep. my favorite thing here is the way when when mike became a host ozzy was like immediately mike are you gonna do episodes on bad games and <laughs> sure enough Immediately, Funny you should ask, immediately, sir. Kronos Digital. <laughs> spoiler. Okay, look, spoiler. Spoiler. Wasting all right? no time at all. <laughs> look, they're not They're not all bad, all right? They're not all bad. Um, <laughs> Badness is a spectrum, and right, some games fall further in one end than the other, you know? Yeah. Um, before we get started on that, though... I uh, just want to say a huge thank you and shout out to all the listeners, the patrons, uh, those of you tuning in live on Twitch. Thank you guys so much. Uh, it's tremendously appreciated. If you like what you hear, it's even more appreciated to kindly leave us a review on the Apple Podcast app. Smash those five stars, please. Uh, we've also got over 100 episodes and counting. Uh, that'll keep you busy during the global apocalypse, I think. <laughs> um, on the chance you would like to learn more about us, we do also have a link tree, L-I-N-K-T-R, uh, period, E-E, slash, region free gamers. And if you're curious, we do have a Patreon. And for the price of a chocolate bar a month, you can access the patron-only Discord channel, and only a few dollars more can get you access to other goodies, like interacting with us, listening live as we record on Twitch, and submitting requests, and being able to vote on what we cover. That's right. You fucking buying those king size 
chocolate bars. <laughs> Last little bit, and then I'm done. All the legal stuff out of the way. You know, you got to do the fine print. Uh, if that's, that's not your right. bag, we got a Discord free for all as well. You can see us all regularly argue about cosmetic microtransactions and whatever sport ball team <laughs> got more nets than the other. That's that right. Um, but <laughs> that's yeah, very kidding aside, but kidding aside, thanks to all the patrons again, Discord members. Podcast is growing. It's going somewhere good every day, and we have you guys to thank for it. So thank yeah. you. Also, yeah, also, get, also would... Mike, just got to give a shout out to new patron Mr. Game and Brews, aka Raphael. He's been hey. he's been a friend of the show since day one, and uh, just yep. recently decided that you know what, I'm actually going to give these guys a little bit of money and help them through with their show, and we really <laughs> appreciate it. So yeah. yeah, man, you're yeah. It was it was interesting too because uh, when he finally joined, I was like, man, we should really do like more with this Patreon stuff. So I was like, what can we do? And then I realized uh, I was gonna invest it in uh, NBA Top Shot. Uh, <laughs> do you know what that is? Yes. <laughs> Hasn't that collapsed Everybody. already? <laughs> no. Wow. Absolutely really? Not. I refuse. I refuse to believe it has, even if it has, uh, <laughs> because I want. I want my sweet NFT of like Vince Carter doing a three sixty dunk. <laughs> I want. I want the NFT. I don't know if you guys saw that GIF that I sent of Andrea Bargnani. I already. I'm not listening to you because of how you pronounce that. You sick. Fuck. I'm. I. I did it just <laughs> for you, sir. Just for you. Perfect. Perfect. We don't call Jeff Geff. Okay, his name is Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the i want what i want is the gif of andrea bargnani like 10 feet from the key jumping to block a shot like just completely <laughs> out of the play i have to send you guys that gif again because like it is honestly my favorite like some guy goes up for a layup andrea is like i swear to god dude like no less than 10 feet from the guy and he does this like pathetic little jump with his arms up it is vintage Bargnani. Vintage Bargnani. <laughs> Do you think you can get a top shot of like the Malice in the Palace of like? <laughs> oh my god, dude! The moment the drink hits Ron Artest and he yes. springs up like the Undertaker, He's fucking just climb. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> oh man, it's oh true. Like it was just like it was like a fucking toaster, man. Dude, you're just like ready to go. Yeah, you know what I mean, like. It's like huge athlete comes and messes with me. Nah, nah, play it cool. Some stranger with a Diet Coke, you're fucking dead. <laughs> you're, dead. you're a dead man. And it's like, all right, whatever. Didn't he punch the wrong guy too? He did. He did. Yeah. yeah. There was a there was a documentary recently on Netflix that it's so good. It's really good. It's it's really, it's really good. good. It shines a lot of light on the situation. It's funny. There's in. I, I'm not really spoiling anything. I don't think, but. Yeah. In the documentary, a lawyer pops up to offer commentary, and immediately Kristen, Christy, and I like our eyes just roll to the top of our heads. Like, oh boy, <laughs> here comes the lawyer defending the people, and you know the and the players suck. And the lawyer was basically like, "Wow, these fans are idiots. Uh, these yeah. these players were completely in their right to defend themselves." And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I was like, "Yes, lawyer." <laughs> no, my favorite, my favorite was the guy who got on the court. And squared up to like a fucking dude. That guy, <laughs> like in the interview. Like, how do I describe this guy except to tell you he's like, just imagine what you think a sports fan who thinks they can take an NBA player looks yeah. like, and it yeah. absolutely looks like that guy. Dude, Perfect. Fifteen years so later, squared... <laughs> that dude has not changed. Not changed. No, absolutely he is the not. Same guy not. in in the interview. Sorry, Arnie, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, no, no. I that's exactly what I was gonna say. Cause he's like, I could have taken him. He <laughs> fucking cheap shot at me. He sucker punched me. Yeah. He wasn't ready for this heat. It's like, so messed up, dude. Yeah. It's so messed up. Like he I sucker punched Oh me. my god. Maybe, maybe it shouldn't have been on the court. Like you know what I mean? To say like he sucker punched me. Like, dude, what are you even doing out there? <laughs> also take into account that this man was like seven beers deep at this point oh, like yeah. he wouldn't fucking he couldn't tell which of the three same looking guys that he saw <laughs> punched him in the face oh my god how man. many Jermaine O'Neal's does this team have yeah, exactly he's like yeah. there's seven Jermaine O'Neal's on this team <laughs> <laughs> fucking great uh, 
Uh, I went to the East, the Big Eastern States Festival. If you guys want to hear about that, sure. What's the? I don't know. I don't even know what it I have is. No idea oh what fuck. Is. Okay, this is great. Oh fuck, Mike. We, we should go to this next year. It's basically yeah. actually That's it's still right. going Mike on. It goes Eastern on till like now. yeah, I am. it goes That's on till like mid October actually. So we could go this year. But oh, basically, sick. what it okay. is is like in Springfield, Massachusetts, so like further out in Western Mass. Sure. Um, they do this thing. They call it the Big E, but it's the Big Eastern States Festival. I, I, my whole knowledge of this is like from the last two years of living here. Okay. Um, basically, what it is is a bunch of like all the New England states get together for a big like agricultural festival okay. slash county fair. Um, so like the first like weeks of it, you go and there's like horse competitions like there's like agricultural stuff going on like you can see like animals and like there's petting zoos and like uh they do stuff like they have like clydesdales like Can't march down the street and stuff and then there's just a bunch of like uh handmade sort of craft stuff so there's like leather workers metal workers uh people who sell like skis and snowboards there was a giant tent that was just selling hot tubs like <laughs> <laughs> like, it's just, like, fucking anything you could imagine. Um, and then the highlight of it, for me, is there's these, like, five, uh, six different, uh, like, nice, beautiful brick buildings, each of them representing one of the six New England states. So you got Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut. Hmm. Uh, Vermont? Fuck. Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine. Uh, okay. I almost fucked that up, <laughs> <laughs> which would have been very bad. It's okay. The Canadian um, was here to help you. And so each of them has, like, stuff in it, like, representing each state. Like, I remember I went to Maine, and I, they were surfing. They had this booth that was doing smoked salmon on a stick. And I was like, oh, fuck, man. This is, this is the Ooh, best. That's living. That is good. That yeah, is good. no, they got fucking lobster rolls. Everybody's got, like, a bunch of beer, obviously, mm. uh, from their different, like, microbreweries and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and then there's like shows, like they'll do concerts stuff. Like the day we went, Billy Idol was playing at like a separate Whoa, sort of arena. What? In, yeah. The day before it was Machine Gun Kelly. So there's what? Clear, really? yeah, there's a, there's a wide berth of like wow. acts that go here. Um, Dude, everything from wild. like country to like pop to rap, like Flo Rida, I think was playing one of the nights. So good. Uh yeah no it was fascinating I mean I I love going just for the food and the drink and like yeah you know just I, we spent like eleven hours there as hot as shit like yes mm. but it was it was really fun I mean I love me a county fair like that is a truly like sp I don't know if like Canada does stuff like this oh, yeah. but that's like yeah. a yeah, yeah incredibly like I was like oh this is like the true American experience here yeah is like getting into a old rust bucket like thrill ride that could at any moment collapse and kill me yep. 100%, uh, while also 100%, eating yeah. like fried ding dongs or whatever dude that's yeah. that is the point like in toronto the uh the cne the x the exhibit the canadian yeah. national exhibition i shouldn't be mm. using acronyms and shit for, <laughs> for things that only i know <laughs> but uh right. yeah the cne in toronto is great similar thing a bunch of rides some of them you know of questionable structural integrity yep and there is a building I kid you not, dude, it is called the food building. And <laughs> the sign on the front of the food building, it just says food building in like the most plain lettering possible. Like there's no there's no build up, nothing. It's just food building. And then you go in there, brace yourself, you buy food. But like <laughs> but the food is like it's all over the place, man. It's like chocolate yeah. covered bacon and like uh. if you if look, if your ambition is to have a heart attack as soon as possible. <laughs> you just wait for the final two weeks of August, and you go to the CNE, yep. the, the X, and you go to the food building, and you will have a wide variety of choices to induce your cardiac arrest. Oh, it's so good, it, it, man. That food building, I miss the food building. Yeah, get the little, get the little toasty donuts. Yes, as well, yes. Right passage. Oh. Gotta get those bad boys. Uh, I can't remember Fuck, what they're man. called. It's like Tiny Tim's or some, I don't know. Tiny, yeah. 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 No, there was like, I mean, you walk around this place and it's like, there is a place that's like, we'll fry anything if you bring it to us. Like, yes. we got fried Oreos, fried mushrooms. Dude, fried this fucking... is what the settlers were hoping for when they colonized America. <laughs> like, this is what it, we will fry anything. Yes, please. Yeah, no, this place is like fucking wild and so we like avoided the fair part of it completely i was like i don't even need to ride but i remember when i was in virginia 
I got on this ride called the Zipper. Dude, the Zipper is the it, greatest ride of all time. Fuck. Oh, my God. We have very differing opinions on the Zipper. <laughs> 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 and so, ba- so you know what it is. It's basically like a thing that goes all the way around, but each little... Po- you get put into a coffin, into like oh, a yeah. metal coffin that <laughs> yeah, individually yeah. spins while the whole machine like goes I around. I don't understand like, and who so- built this... Like, it's one of these things I look at, like, which engineer was like, this is what I want. It's like, like, imagine if, it's like, imagine if you ever saw a chainsaw and you saw, like, the little blade on it and you were like, oh, I wish I could get into one of these little blades while it's spinning. Like, that's the zipper. (laughs) Um, And so I got into it with a friend of mine and me and her were like, oh, we've never been on this thing. Like, let's get in. So we get in the thing. And as soon as they lock us in the thing, we're like, all right, where's the seatbelt? And we're like, oh, fuck, there isn't one. <laughs> yeah. So you're basically like you're basically in a metal box. And you have to like hold on to these like handrails yeah. that are yeah. in front of you. And Hope this you thing got... starts spinning. And immediately we just like slam right into the front of the thing <laughs> and then slam right into the back of it. And we're like, fuck. Within like the first minute, we're like, we regret everything. And so it goes yeah. for like two, three minutes and it stops. Yeah. And we're like, oh, fuck. Thank Christ. And we're waiting and we're waiting and like nobody comes through to like let us out. And then the fucking ride starts up again. <laughs> and we're like, no! and we like just like, I think I may have dislocated my shoulder while I was in that machine. And then after the second one, they let us out. If I might oh. add, when they when they close the cage on you, it is a cage. You're yes. like a wild animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And they're not letting you out. When they close the cage, the cage is secured by a small metal clip. Yeah. Like slightly larger than a paper clip. (laughs) Like at any point you could slam into this door and it would fly open and you just fall out off this machine. It's so great, man. I I've I go on the zipper (laughs) like three times in a row. I not only that, but like my friends and I had a game, like we would count who could spin it the most times. And I because like you can it goes like it it twists you like up you know ass over tea kettle right and yeah. i think i think i spun it like 13 times once and oh my yeah, god i know it's dude it's it's so Fuck. good i don't blame you for hating it but no it was one of those things where i was like i'd go on this again but because it's such a unique experience it truly is like how like what's the closest you can get to like a a theme park ride you designed as like an 8 year old um and not die yeah but it's like physically painful to be on it like i i honestly feel like in 10 years you will have like some like chronic uh pain in your body that's specifically from the zipper oh i think that finish line has been crossed <laughs> like zipper zipper disease so you're gonna yeah it's gonna be like syndrome? zipper jolt zipper elbow or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, yeah oh my god um, video games video games Okay. Oh my god. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Um, <laughs> I love it because, like, I was just gonna. I'm just gonna turn around and ask you guys a question anyway. I'm very excited for this question, though. So, video games. We are going to take a closer look at Kodos Digital, who are a development team, uh, and their games. Uh, some of the interesting stuff surrounding them. Uh, but before that, and we're about to take a break. Uh, just after this, but I kind of wanted to set the tone a little bit and um really looking forward to answers here what uh paul I'll start with you because you sounded really excited about this yeah what is your favorite game video game ad campaign and when i say that let me just put some context out there for the listeners doesn't mean it, it doesn't have to be good doesn't have to be bad could be good could be bad could be bizarre can be a single thing can be the whole campaign can be whatever just what you know give me your answer what do you think well sadly because i am who i am it is not a good campaign and i love it <laughs> because it's not a good campaign do you guys remember professional gamer jamie who sold us on gyaries for the sega genesis oh that that mullet oh that is one of the most magnificent mullets that yes. one can hope for not only oh, not amazing. only the mullet, but like the crappy teenage mustache in one of the ads. Yeah. At least in one of the ads, he shaves. But in the other ad, he's sitting there proudly with his, you know, post pubescent almost facial hair. Like I remember this. Oh my god. It's 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 great. It's great that this guy yeah. is teaching us how to pronounce Gyrus 
and yeah. <laughs> also like the i love that he's a professional gamer and then in the paragraph <laughs> below one of the ads they say he's a game tester and it's like <laughs> those are two wildly different things <laughs> like what professional gamer i think like esports guy I mean, he games for his profession you but know what I mean? no like, arnie true. you're absolutely right that is what he does he is technically right which is the best form of being right <laughs> 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 anyway yeah the uh the guy race ads oh, if any that f- if for the folks listening that, you gotta look this that, up man. on that ad yeah. couldn't you also like mail in for like a guy race shirt or something Correct. I, would, I would sell my soul for a guy race <laughs> t-shirt like a original right. yeah. legit guy race t-shirt more than <laughs> more than any other one and let me tell you man the turbo graphics there are some sweet turbo graphics t-shirts that i would yeah. love to have but the guy race is is the number as the ad says guy race is number one <laughs> yeah, full 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 page spread. Dude standing there with exactly as Paul's describing him. I think he's giving like a thumbs up. Yeah, like with yep. this big smile. But that's it. It's him, and that's it. And it's like it's pronounced this way. Yeah, <laughs> and that's the ad. It's it how is you know fantastic. you've made a good game oh, when you have to man. teach people how to pronounce it. <laughs> that was an uh, amazing amazing choice. Did not ex- I I should have expected that. It makes perfect sense. But I was thinking you were going to say something else, and that, that'll that probably be, be my pick unless Arnie picks it. Uh, Arnie, what about you? Uh, I mean, for me, it, it's got to be like anything fucking like play it loud Game Boy. Was, right. They were all so, so fucking bad and so good. <laughs> but like, I don't know what it was about the Game Boy. And I've shared my specific favorite one with you in the Discord. Mm-hmm. Um, Nintendo just like did not give a fuck about what they were doing when it came to, like, advertising Game Boy stuff. And so my favorite one is this original Game Boy ad that I'm sure you've either seen or heard of, where, and somebody was like, oh, yeah, this is great. We gotta gotta do this. (laughs) It's a full-page ad where a woman is, like, handcuffed to a bed... Um, yes and she's wearing like a uh, like lingerie or something like if you go if you go to the discord right now mike i i've i've shared with you the exact picture i'm talking about okay um and she's like wearing some kind of lingerie and then in the corner you just see a guy's hands like holding an original game boy and it says like game boy it's seriously distracting or something yeah. and it just looks so oh insane my god like, because her face like i think they were trying to go for like oh she's like pissed at you or whatever but it kind of comes off as like surprise but when you look at it it's like this woman is terrified yeah, <laughs> like absolutely. something evil is about absolutely. to happen to her. man like, that's so bad we have to find Somebody out who did it first that. because there's a similar neo geo one where oh really yeah where there's a woman in lingerie oh, and she's standing at the door to the bedroom looking pissed off because her nerd boyfriend is holding like the oh, giant Neo Geo joystick this. and he's holding yeah. it like if I remember correctly, he's holding it in a similar manner to like the guy with the the skater guy with the Nokia <laughs> N gauge, where like oh he's like fuck. physically contorting, like, oh my god, this yeah. game is like whoa <laughs> holding the joystick that way. And the woman's all pissed off because and I think the ad was something like ever since he got the Neo Geo, he ignores me. But you know, with better wording than that. <laughs> Yeah, we got to yeah. find out who did this one first, either either Nintendo or SNK. One of them, one of them played that trope, and they both played them yeah. terribly. That so very it's, bad. It's funny that reminds me of a good one. I can't remember if it was Best Buy or it was GameStop, but apparently there was. I think it was for the PS3. They they were doing some kind of promotion where they were like, "Oh, if you traded this thing, you get a PS3." And the, and it was like a couple. It was like a girl, like girlfriend and boyfriend sitting on a couch. And it was like, yeah, and with the PS3, like you can watch, you know, you can watch Blu-rays and also play games. And she's like, and, and it's like, my girlfriend's like really happy I got mine. I sold her on the Blu-ray player. And she's like, thanks, honey. I love you. And he's like, I love you too, PS3. And then like, that's the ad. That's the ad. And I was like, all right, that's kind of funny. I was like, that's kind of funny. It's kind of legit. I mean... Oh um, yeah, no, there was like, for some reason, there was this trend of like, oh, yeah, no, children will appreciate these like, adult relationship jokes. Yeah. Like, we gotta really, we gotta really hammer it home now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. Because I, I'm assuming all these were in like, comic books and stuff. Or maybe like, gay magazines. Gay game magazines, magazines mainly, yeah. Gay magazines. Yeah. Um, so, so my, know. so my call, my call, I mean, there's so many, there's so many awesome ones. 
I mean, the most predictable would have been, I mean, the most predictable and the most iconic would have obviously been, you know, suck it down um, <laughs> with with our boy John Romero um, basically <laughs> plugging Daikatana. But my pick, my pick has got to be uh, the contest that Acclaim had for, uh, it, it's a prize for anyone who would call their kid Turok. That's my favorite. Oh, oh my, my favorite. God. <laughs> um, and it was the biggest, the, one of the, one of the, and a, a friend of mine, we actually looked into it because we were like, oh my God, we have the power of the internet now. Who called their kid Turok? Yeah. Like we got to, someone must have looked this up <laughs> and someone did. And, and sadly, uh, no one did. Sadly, oh, no one actually oh, called their I, no one actually called their kid Turok. I bet if um, they if they would have allowed middle names, a bunch of people would have done it. Yeah, no, no question. <laughs> I, I absolutely, yeah, no question. That's too bad. Turok, yeah. it's not the worst name. It's not a terrible name. Yeah, yeah. it's. I mean, it's kind of badass. I, uh, but I don't know. Man. I don't know, <laughs> man. You can take think... a hit off of your. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turok sounds like he'd be a great NFL player. Like yeah, I don't I don't fair. know how many NFL players are named Elliot, but mm. you know what I'm saying? But if you name your kid yeah. Turok, you've got yourself an offensive lineman. Yeah. I was gonna go with defensive end, but I think we both agree, just a large man. Turok was a <laughs> hunter, Arnie, not a protector. Mm, Correct. Fair enough. Dinosaur fair hunter. Enough. So <laughs> Uh, thank you for sharing, gentlemen. Uh, I'm sure I'm sure Chad is baffled right now, but trust me, this is going to come back. This is effective foreshadowing. Well, I don't know how effective it's going to be. We don't anyway, do whatever. that complicated but, on this show. But, uh, but uh, we're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, we're going to have a little bit of a history lesson about Kronos. back uh ready for chronos's origin story let's let's get to it uh just as a reminder chronos digital uh developer primarily made stuff on the psx uh although as we'll see a couple other consoles so in 1992 stanley Liu founds the company uh it started out as an animation and a cg effect house which bit of foreshadowing here kind of makes sense when you look oh, at yeah. the kind of games that they made yeah um and not just <laughs> The good and the bad. I'll just say that. <laughs> um, they landed an opening cinematic gig for King's Quest VI. That was their first actual credited uh, uh, project that they work on. They saw that as a way to offer their services to games. That was initially how it started out. Stanley hadn't really considered making his own games at that point. Stanley's background was primarily, again, in animation. I don't know offhand the the precise projects he was involved with, but he was involved with a whole bunch of sort of Hollywood big-budget blockbuster animation before yeah. that. Um, the brunt of his experience was in cinematics and animation for stuff like Eternal Champions on Sega CD, which... Uh, that's amazing. Just, <laughs> yes. I, I don't know. I don't know anything. It, it's like, honestly, I don't know anything else to say about the stuff I'm about to say. It's just amazing. Like, I just saw like, oh, cool. <laughs> he worked on Eternal Champions, Wing Commander 3, and the uh, 1994 Spider-Man animated series. Best, and best Spider-Man the, dude, animated yeah. show. It's so, so good. Oh, yeah, fuck. there there are clips of it, and you could see the 3D animation. And honestly, like I can com- <laughs> I can completely understand why at the time somebody was like, "Yo, we got to get these Kronos dudes." Um, yeah. So the the big project, the the thing that kind of started to put them on the map was Phantasmagoria, which is obviously super famous game. Uh, they provided work for Sierra, mostly art assets. Um, and it was right around that time, like that success kind of emboldened them to do it. They got good pay from it and good critical success. Um, uh, and it kind of emboldened them to get ready to do it. But it was actually during the production of those assets. So in like 94, that was when Stanley was like, hey, mm-hmm. man, like, Let's do it. We want to make video games. Let's go for it. This is easy. Um, this is super easy. Yeah, yeah. This is super easy. <laughs> and if you look super at easy. and if you look at Phantasmagoria, I think I think you could see why he might think that. Look, I, I'm like That's I'm not a, gonna such a good point. I'm not gonna pretend to know 
the mind of Stan, <laughs> of Stanley Lou, right? But like, right, yeah. A game like Phantasmagoria is very, it's very Sierra, and I don't want to say it's yes. very simple, but it's a point and click, right? Yes. So mm-hmm. that is not the most complicated game to make, I think. <laughs> no. And now, and to be fair, yeah. they also did a really good job on it. Like I remember, yeah, I didn't yeah. play Phantasmagoria when it came out, but I kind of wish I had. I played it like three four years after the fact and by then actually you know what no by then it still looked good like that was yeah. mm-hmm. when i was back yeah. when i was working at eb games like that was a strong selling game i think also because yeah. the name of it is really 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 good name yeah that's a good name but yeah. like i was just watching video again of it yesterday and yeah it looks good man it, like it's it's so yeah. it's so weird it's like green screen actors but on these computer generated backgrounds that are yeah. semi photorealistic it's it's a cool effect yeah. yeah isn't phantasmagoria the one where like one of the kills that happens is that a woman gets like decap like basically yes. a pendulum comes and like splits yep. her face in half or something yeah there's some foreshadowing God. of that in the intro so by the way good. fantastic intro the uh, the main yeah. character the um, the lady she has these nightmares and the nightmare ends with her face being like trapped in like an iron maiden and then she yeah. wakes up and her boyfriend takes like 5 seconds to comfort her and then they start having sex <laughs> <laughs> and at the time i was like what the fuck is this <laughs> it, and it's like it's semi it's like not quite yeah. Cinemax because you don't yeah. you don't see full boob, but there's generous side boob, and mm-hmm. she's just like on top of him. I was like, "What the fuck?" Right? <laughs> very, very much like, very kind of like in your face. Like this is going to be an adult game. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, and that's another great bit of foreshadowing. Now that you <laughs> yeah. it. Um, I love that very much an adult game. Like that's the attitude you're going to see going forward quite yeah, a bit. Yeah. And I, and I love it. Um, so they start talking to, so Kroto start talking to Sony. Um, Sony had a license for a comic character. Haven't been able to find any information on what specifically it was. Ah. Um, and so they asked Kronos, Hey, come up with some game concepts that would fit the license. So Kronos come up with a fighting game. Okay, 3D <laughs> fighting game, and I already said Arnie's already giggling. Oh man, and <laughs> oh, and so Paul's bad. already Paul's already snickering, and it's like yeah. So they came up with a fighting game, 3D fighters, Western 3D fighters, early 3D. Yeah, not. It's already like ooh. <laughs> um, so their idea was that characters could learn new moves, and that they would actually change physically, and their attributes would raise over time. Mm, sounds kind of cool. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, according to Lou, Sony lost the license to their Europe division. That's what I've read, and they were never told why. So rather than ditch all the work they did, the team revamped it with an original IP, and then they pitched it to Vic Tokai, um, mm. publishers Vic Tokai, Vic Tokai, Vic to- uh, whatever. Um, I, I, one of my favorite publisher names for this exact reason. Yeah, pretty great. Yeah, pretty great. <laughs> um, the condition, though, and. I this makes me freak out every time I read it. So the condition <laughs> was that they had to have it ready for Christmas that year, which was six months away. <laughs> and they didn't even they didn't even have dev kits. They didn't even have a way to build a game on the PlayStation yet before they I agreed feel like to this. It's amazing. All, I feel like half of all good video game stories start with like, and they needed to have it finished by holiday of X year. Oh, dude. It's true. E.T. It's so true. E.T., <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Five weeks. Uh, you got five yeah, weeks to make this game. I got this. So, yeah. <laughs> so Stanley, so Stanley, you at first apparently was going to push back, but they were so desperate to get in. They were just like, you know what? Fuck it bite the bullet let's do it yeah um let's dive in the deep end let's do it so that game turned into criticom hey. uh that Ooh. came out on the playstation yeah Woo. so it came out on the playstation globally uh but it only came out uh came out on the saturn but only in north america and japan in 1997 the playstation was spread out the the, the playstation (laughs) was spread out between 95 and 96 so as you can tell by my hosts just (laughs) <laughs> They're just itching to jump on this. So as you can tell, it was not it was not well received. It was a um it was a critical so critical flop. Um it did 
it was a reasonable commercial success, though. Um, Which is I think amazing. Incredible. Pe- I mean, like, people it, are saying, oh. you know, early release, early yep. release. Yeah. Fighters, I mean, fighters were really big then. Yeah. So that also kind of makes sense. Um, you know, Vic Takai were happy. They were like, okay, cool. And it gave Kronos kind of the confidence that they needed to kind of keep going, not to mention probably the resources, which, you know, makes sense. I mean, honestly, like still making something in six months that doesn't make your PlayStation 1 explode. I mean, it's <laughs> yeah, it's still pretty good. I mean, I know some people are thinking that's a low bar, but it's not actually. <laughs> it's no, not. it's not. Like, it's, it's so you know. it's so bizarre because like you want to much like much like et like i just said on the 2600 right Mm -hmm. like you want to applaud the developer for creating something in an impossible timeline and yet and yet yeah criticom is dude i remember even i remember this game like (laughs) yeah and it's not good like and i wish i wish i had the sensibility that i have now back then but back then like here's the thing you only had you had limited resources right like you couldn't afford yeah. to go out and get a criticom games weren't mm-hmm. you know five bucks and we didn't have mod yeah. chips yet it was still early in the pc or um in the playstation's life cycle so mm-hmm. we couldn't get burn games for pennies on on the dollar mm-hmm. right so we didn't have an opportunity to play criticom but i remember the reviews this was <laughs> not a well-reviewed game and i'm shocked no. that it did well like it has to be because it was an early release and yeah you know we just people guess, just bought it sight unseen yeah i guess so like, yeah right, i mean you know go. it nice looking box interesting title mm-hmm. so yep. yeah well you're getting you're getting to the real i mean number one hey how much how, we're selling it right we're selling it right now boy are we selling <laughs> go and play criticom. And criticom go and play it um no but but i mean it's it's a really good point and it i think it really speaks to it it must have been yeah because fighters are really big and it was early in the life cycle but i want you know how much of it was also that it might have for the time just kind of looked cool you know like yeah. looked interesting like chronos had some interesting character designs it did have the the gameplay stuff that lou was talking about it was in there mm-hmm. um you know so it would adjust the the avatar's uh appearance which is you know that's kind of cool sure. i mean not not a ton of yeah. fighting games kind of do that um but apparently just it just ran really bad and <laughs> one kind of cool little tidbit i found was that all of the animation was handled by hand and none of it was mocap. Oh, wow. Now don't get now don't get me wrong, mocap's expensive, it's time consuming. Mm-hmm. I I'm not like faulting Kronos for not using mocap. I just think it's interesting. I just think yeah. it's interesting that like okay, doing it by hand, I could see how you would lose some of the nuance and you'd kind of be getting into the uncanny valley and it would just sort of look and feel wrong. Criticom, ladies and gentlemen. It. That's I... <laughs> Uh, I gotta, so, I gotta be honest with you, Mike. Yeah. When you, when you pitched this idea, I was like, "What the fuck?" Like, because I had not played any of these games. And I'm like, "All right, well, let's right. go see what the fuck this is all about." Like, Mike yeah. really seems to like this developer. And I typed in Criticom to YouTube, and I want to say like the first five videos on the search results are like the worst fighting yes. game ever. Yes. 100%. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, the letters. The Absolutely. worst. And I, and I worst. just like yeah. pushed my glasses up and they became covered in glare. And I yeah. was like, Oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like now, now you have now my it attention. All makes Mike. Sense. Now you have my attention. <laughs> great, great headlines. Great headline for, yeah. for getting those clicks, for getting those views. So, Oh yeah. So shocker, shock, and and just one more little note about it. Um, shocker, the Saturn version was worse in every. What? Regard. I know, really? I know, it's crazy, right? <laughs> totally wild. I mean, and and I'm I imagine it didn't help the optics also that it came out two years after the PlayStation version did. Incredible. And it ran and it ran worse. If I can, <laughs> if I can just... find Criticom for the Saturn for less than 20 bucks oh you yeah. know it's a 300 dollars game <laughs> oh, don't remind know me. it if i can find it for less than 20 bucks i think i'm gonna get it i think yeah. i just kind of want to have that little piece of history so this is the first game in what was coined the trilogy of terror and love it. this is love it i know I'm so it's like so many these games so many i know it's so many levels i love it um and uh 
And it, it kind of applies too because some of the themes that they're dealing with, mm-hmm. like we should say that Criticom is kind of this dark sci-fi meets kind yeah. of medieval fantasy picture picture just the clunkiest 3d fighter you can imagine and that's yep. pretty much it yeah um, i'll tell you this i saw the opening cinematic yeah and i was like oh shit this oh looks no fucking, it's great this all looks cool. the cinematics it's, it's great like this top. looks oh, really great. good it took me back i was like this is when i was watching reboot and yeah. fucking yeah. east wars like mm-hmm. this looks very good of yeah. for the time like of that era i was like yeah i would i would have played this yeah. for like five minutes past the intro screen <laughs> So once that's done, and I love how Stan kind of, Stan kind of mentions he's like, we kind of got stuck making fighting games after that because we were one of the only he the way he puts it is we were one of the only developers in the West who had made a fighting game, and so we kind of got stuck with that. Not to mention that the reputation of having made Criticom kind of hung over their head for a while, <laughs> um, for better and worse. Yeah. So the next the next game in the the trilogy of terror was Dark Rift, and Dark Rift is one that I recognize a lot more. Clearly, I I can't tell you how many times I've seen this N64 card sitting in a retro never, shop. Never, um, never I've seen, seen this. In I, oh life. my god, I've seen this so many times. Now, I this was released worldwide in uh, in 1997 on the N64. Um, but I I want to I want oh and sorry, eventually uh, on Windows in North America in 97, mm. it was also published by Vic Tokai. But I just want to get their a, fucking lesson the first time. Huh? Did did not apparently. <laughs> but I I want to give a special shout out. To the release in Japan in 1998, which was called... Who wants to say the title of the, the game for me? Space Dynamites. <laughs> Space Dynamites. <laughs> Space Dynamites. I don't even... Like, it doesn't sound like Dark dark Rift. Oh, my God. Space Dynamites. Off well, to eBay, you know, I uh, uh, yeah. Space is dark, and Dynamites create rifts uh, sure. in, the, in the soil. Oh. Sure. Which they explode. Nice. Not bad. Nice. Not That's bad. a straight line right there. Uh, one to the other um, <laughs> so another 3d fighter this time much more of a uh a little more of a sci-fi bent but still kind of the similar sci-fi with swords yeah. kind of thing uh it was a it was originally criticom 2 but for some reason i mean i don't know why but they get decided <laughs> not to call it that i don't know i mean i'm assuming do you want yeah, more criticom all, yeah <laughs> do i have we the want game more? for you t- I think this was this was the one that ran 60 FPS, right? Or was yes. that yeah. yeah. Yes, that is correct. Um Incre- which amazing is, by it is N64 incredible. standards. It is incredible. I mean the fact that it was kind of it was running in 60 FPS, um it was the first I mean it's it's sort of technically the first native fighting game um on the N64, mm-hmm. although there was a plain Saturn release <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I just laugh every time. There was a play of Saturn release that got canceled, so then that would have made it, you know, that's well, what I, I mean. Well, I mean, 15 tech- FPS probably isn't going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, so Dark Rift, I haven't played Dark Rift. Um, I have played Criticom a little bit, just enough, just a taste. I haven't played Dark Rift. Um, uh, I know I know, we're going a little quick here, but it's kind of I, I kind of want to do the trilogy of terror in one big swath yeah, and yeah. kind of hear what it, what people are thinking. I'll so tell the you last this, man, like yeah, also looks really good. Like, yes, looks you know good. for for all these like the aesthetics were never the problem. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah, 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 the game mechanics, the animation, the animation was done with mocap this time. Yep. I, honestly, like when you look at footage of Dark Rift. It looks totally capable. It looks fine. Again, I think it's, and in this case, it runs really well. So Mm -hmm. it really isn't just kind of the game feel and the lack of interesting design decisions. Like most of what I see about Dark Rift is just that, yeah, it's fine. Like people are like, it's okay. Like it's kind of mediocre. It doesn't really, you know. (laughs) I saw a video where the guy who was playing, I don't know if it was the player or the AI but he could not win. And not only could right. he not win, it was fucking embarrassing. Like, the AI was yeah. just manhandling him. And yeah. at the end of one particular round, he was down to, like, a sliver of life, and then the AI player had full life. And then he just he just jumped off the arena into the void. He's like, I give up. <laughs> he just jumped backwards. It was so great. Yeah. That's there so, is there that's is so a sad. there's yeah. a through line in a lot of, in like all three of these where like 
one, the AI will just fucking decimate you if you don't know what you're <laughs> yeah, doing. Yes. But two, it's like if you get caught in a combo, you're just kind of fucked. Like it'll take like 80% of your health in one go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They might have been going yeah. for a killer instinct kind of vibe. Yes. And, uh, yeah. Ee, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. <laughs> Dark Dark Rift Dark Rift not 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 for me not one that I've played my yeah. my janky N sixty four three D fighter of choice choice will always be Mace the Dark Age ah. oh. that's that's the one for yeah. me yeah also yep. just thinking of like playing a three D fighter on the N sixty four like makes my nose start bleeding from a brain <laughs> I, know. I know I know I think about it I'm like oh. Um, who needs Tekken anyway yeah (laughs) so so yeah so general consensus about Dark Rift is that better than Criticom yeah that's Mm. kind of the general consensus um and then finally the last 3D fighter in the trilogy of terror is Cardinal Sin my favorite uh, spelt S-Y-N thank you for pointing Uh, that out if you didn't I definitely would (laughs) have Oh, 100%. Uh, so PlayStation so PlayStation exclusive, it was released in North America and Europe, not Japan, in 1998, uh, published by Sony. Just published by Sony this time. Um, the added gimmick was that there was interactive stages and uh, stage hazards. So including crates, you could destroy yeah. them to get items and power-ups. Um, I'm sure you're all out there thinking, oh, Urgeis. Power Stone. Yeah, that's no, what I was no, thinking. Power just, Stone, maybe. Just, no, no. <laughs> oh, God, no. So, it's not a sequel. Uh, this this kind of focuses on much more of a dark fantasy world, similar to Dungeons & Dragons. This is where me and the critics tend to differ, okay? So, mm-hmm. it seemed to review well, okay? About <laughs> as well as Dark Rift, oh, if not a bit better. Thank goodness. Showing kind, of, showing kind of an upward trend. Now, I actually have Cardinal Sin. It's awful. I'm like I'm I played so glad and, that this is what uh, happened because I was Mike. I was legitimately concerned that it was reviewed poorly, and that you were going to say actually it's pretty good. <laughs> oh no! And then no, I would have no, no, we would have no, no, had no. to sadly let you go from the Region Free Gamers podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never I'd never do you guys dirty like that. It's it's bad. I was I mean now to be fair to be fair some of it is playing it now and it doesn't hold up well. Yeah. But wow, it's just incredibly stiff. It looks amazing. I mean, it doesn't help that I'm not really into a D&D aesthetic. Maybe if somebody was, they'd be more into it. Mm-hmm. The thing that I find the most remarkable about it that I, I just started laughing out loud was I'm watching the opening cinematic. And again, That's, it's Kronos. It's so it's, so it's beautiful for the time. It's awesome. But then the narrator starts talking and he yeah. starts doing this exposition. And Artie, if you've. Yes, Artie I saw the, I watched the watching. whole thing. He talks he, so fast. He goes so, so fast, fast that at and one point, what he's saying doesn't yeah. match what's on the screen. Oh, because yeah. It hasn't it's gotten so to funny. that point yet. <laughs> it's so funny. I just started laughing and I started laughing louder and louder as it was going on. I was like, guys, guys, slow it down. It's slow it down like slow down you know like the guy is just talking so fast and and explaining what's happening in the story and you're uh-huh. like okay i get it i get it she's bad there's you know um so <laughs> that's the dark trilogy <laughs> and then the oh, oh man. man oh god oh <sighs> so i so like i said my experience is mostly with Cardinal Sin. Yeah. Uh, played a little bit of Criticom. Haven't played Dark Rift. All of them, at best, are kind of clunky Western takes on stuff like Soul Blade. Yeah. Um, or at, you know, or maybe Power Stone. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on these? Have you guys played them? Did you see them? Have you seen them out in the wild, even? That kind I've, of thing. I've never heard of any of them. Like I, I, when you put these on yeah. here, I was like, "Have we been playing like completely different consoles?" Because I have no idea what the fuck any of these things are. Right. But I watched them and I was like, "Oh, so much wasted potential, man!" Like, <laughs> like the cinematics were great, the yeah. aesthetic was great, even the character design for a lot of yeah. it I thought was really yeah. good. Like in mm-hmm. Dark Rift, I think they have this whole gimmick of like there's like three dimensions: a dark dimension, a like neutral dimension, and a yep. light dimension, and they have characters from each one that look very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the stages reflect like sort of the different uh aspects of each one i was like mm-hmm. oh this is so nice if only it was like halfway playable like, yeah <laughs> it yeah. looks 
Like, it looks bad when you, even watching other people play it, I was like, I don't know who's who, I don't know who's winning, I don't know what's happening, like, it doesn't really look like you can do, like, combos, like, people are just grabbing each other randomly. Yeah. Um, But, and, like, Cardinal Sin was the best one, Yeah. because, honestly, as soon as I saw someone start playing it, they were the first stage they went into was like this castle looking stage. And the hazard there is that there's like six points on the wall where like a crossbow will randomly appear and like shoot an arrow. So and I was like, Fuck it's this. so Fuck this it's entire so... thing. The most infuriating thing in just, a one on one fighting yeah. game just is just random worst. shit happening to you. Yes. There was another shoot. one yeah. where it's like you touch this green slime and it poisons you. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, it's so good. Fuck. No, it's so good. <laughs> like, you gotta, I got to share. I, I'm sorry. I got to share. I was pl- I was just playing it a couple days ago just to refresh my memory. And one of the stages is in a mine because you're fighting a dwarf <laughs> and there's a giant <laughs> mine cart like the size of a zamboni that is constantly going back and forth in the middle of the arena oh, and, and it just and if it hits you you go flying and i'm like yeah. this is such a terrible idea <laughs> it's like it's like it's like a basic balancing can you imagine competitive oh competitive oh. cardinal sin we could only be so lucky fighting game league get on it get on it where are you <laughs> yeah no man this 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 trilogy is this this is kind of Chronos Digital's calling card, I think. I mean, we're going to talk about yeah. some of the games they made that were actually not bad. But yeah. a lot of style over substance. Yeah. You yes. know, like you had. Yeah. And and it's in their pedigree. Like this is Yeah. Congratulations, Victor Kai. Like yeah. you knew this was coming. This is this is what they were before they started making these fighting games. So, mm-hmm. but I mean, they made 3 of them, so it's not yeah. like they weren't successful. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So going to take a quick look now, uh, we're sort of, I mean, we're backtracking chronologically a little bit because we're going back to 1997, but I think their next title kind of stands a little bit on its own. Um, It was published by Playmates Interactive and it was only on PC. It was released worldwide in PC in 1997 and it's a game called Meat Puppet. Now, Meat Puppet... (laughs) I didn't even know existed. I knew about the Trilogy of Terror, but I had no idea that Me Puppet was a thing before I started doing the research. I fully admit that. And oh my God, <laughs> if I had known, if I had known, I would have been obsessed with this game. Okay, this, <laughs> this game is would. this game yeah. is this game is 17-year-old Mike's like dream yep. come true. So let me let me give you the breakdown for better and worse, by the way. Let me give you the breakdown. So an isometric action strategy game. If you guys have ever heard of Crusader No Remorse, kind of similar to that. Uh so it has an isometric view, kind of like the old Fallout games, and it's essentially a mix of of running gun type gameplay with something that's a little more strategic. Like, you got to be careful. You're not overwhelmed by enemies. It's not like mm-hmm. Gauntlet or something. So it's a cyberpunk, and this, this is where it starts. This is where it are. You're just going to hear all this, and even with what little uh, some of you guys might know. I mean, I know Paul's known me for a while, um, and Arnie's getting to know me. Arnie's going to go, <laughs> oh, yeah, this is Mike as shit. So <laughs> a cyberpunk sci-fi setting yep. where you play as a character named Lotus Abstraction. <laughs> Lotus <laughs> abstraction. Okay, she uh, plays a she plays a meat puppet. It's a term in the world that's used for both a person who is a cyber brainwashed assassin um, into be uh, cyber brainwashed into being a servant and a slave, and in this case also as a disposable assassin, which mm-hmm. you know, kind of Manchurian candidate vibes. That's kind of yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's okay. Um, Along with her AI partner, who oh, I can't remember his name, um, <laughs> who is also in servitude, they plot a way to survive and turn on their master. But in the meantime, they must take out key figures in six different mega corporations. It's very dark. It's very bleak. It's very violent. It's very gory. It's very nihilistic. In other words, it's very late nineties as fuck. Yep. Lots of and crunchy guitar and riffs in this one, And Paul. it's aged It's aged like the <laughs> shittiest cheese you can imagine. And, and I love aged it. like a so, fine wine that was aged, left out in the sun. Yeah, aged like, aged like vinegar. So this is, I mean, just going to touch on this a little bit, but 
this game to me is pretty significant because it really sort of foreshadows and it really gives you a big indication of where Kronos are going in terms of not just in terms of the kind of games they want to make and the topics they're going to cover, but also their ad campaigns, hint, hint, um, <laughs> and the kind of their visuals and how they're trying to get attention. Uh, um, so everything I've said, I, everything I've said right now, if I've colored a picture that kind of uh, reminds you of Eon Flux, Dark City, The Crow, <laughs> Ghost in the Shell, congratulations me, I did my job. Because that's pretty much what it looks like. Yeah. Um, and so there's so little about this game online, by the way. Like, yeah. compared to most other games, there was a YouTube review that just went up, like, two <laughs> weeks ago. But other than that, I can't, I can barely find anything. Um, so, anyway, it's... It looks cool. It has this uh, really interesting aesthetic. It, I definitely would want to play it. It seems like critical consensus is that, hey, uh, spoiler alert, very stylish, very cool looking, kind of clunky. Um, but I think what happened in this, I think what happened this time around, and as we're going to get into after the break, is that they turned up the edgy factor yeah. to yeah. 9,000. <laughs> and because trust me if you watch the cinematics for this there's all kinds of swearing everybody oh, yeah. looks like everybody <laughs> looks like there's wearing everybody looks like they're wearing bondage gear there's tons of body horror and things like that and again don't get me wrong i think some of this stuff is still really striking even today and it makes it kind of cool and it makes it stand out and at the time it must have been great but at the same time there's some elements of it that are just so you know, your eyes roll so fast in the back of your head. <laughs> Very much you so. Know, you know, you're seeing stars. Bro. Uh, so no, have, I, uh... have, have you guys even heard of this? I saw it on the shelves back in the day and I recognized, Whoa! yeah, I recognize the, I recognize the box. I reckon, had I, have I played it? Hell no. No, no, no. Like, <laughs> but that, that was it. Like, I just remember because it's a, it's not a difficult name to it's a difficult name to forget is what I'm getting yeah. at. Cause it's a bit, yeah. you know, ridiculous. So yeah, no, I do. I do remember this game existing, but like it was literally just like one of dozens of PC games on the shelves yeah. that I had yeah. no idea and no interest in, in playing. Yeah. Congratulations, Meat Puppet. <laughs> <laughs> I you watched a, um, I watched a first play of it. So like 30 some minutes of, of gameplay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, watch the intro. Couldn't see yeah. shit. I was like, this is yeah. dude, this is you have to dark. turn the brightness up to like max. To well, that's what game. I was going to say on the first play I was watching. They go through the whole intro thing and then the guy immediately goes into like the options and like starts turning the brightness up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, <laughs> immediately. Um, but I was like, kind of like Mike, I was like, oh, this is I, I could see like, especially when it came out, like if I had not been like six, like if I'd been like 13, I'd be like, oh, yeah, this would be oh, like, God, I, this would be dope to play uh you know it's one of those where it's like they're talking in all techno babble and then he's like and then he's a shit ass motherfucker like <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah but the yeah. game but, itself uh, like i don't do it i don't i don't like i had to, I had to skip around <laughs> so long yeah. to watch them actually like encounter an enemy like it felt yeah. kind of sparse in the beginning yeah and then it did honestly one of my favorite read least favorite things in a game which is when an AI has like two canned things that they say and they just say them over, over and, and over, over yeah. and over again. Yeah. Uh, as you murder them. Um, and it's isometric, which automatically means that I hate it. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it looked, it looked really, I mean, aesthetically again, it fucking delivers like, it's it looks really cool it also looked kind of hard to control i remember the oh, guy yeah. who was playing yeah. it was trying to like get up on ledges and stuff and he just gets stuck on like geometry and have to yeah. move around for the character to do what he wanted it to yeah. um but yeah no like tonally aesthetically i'm with mike i was like fuck yeah there's a lot of like nice crunchy guitars here <laughs> a lot of like incomprehensible like yeah uh, what i would call like i don't even know what to call it like screamo type stuff or like just like hard sort of rock riffs. industrial i think is the yeah, yeah that's that's for, yeah. that's more what i'm it's looking very for industrial and it's i mean again four for four chronos man you guys are bad in a thousand you know <laughs> no i mean all kidding aside 
I'm I'm with you guys. You know, I'm not a big isometric guy. It does not look like a game that I'd actually enjoy playing. Yeah. Again, the atmosphere is really interesting. And I think it sets up really well where they're going to sort of go next. And we are going to get to that. Uh, but I think we should take a break first before we do our little deep dive into the Fear Effect series. Those who were present at this gathering have related a strange tale filled with inexplicable power. A tale that is only concluded when the woman magically turned the scrolls into inscripted swords. This woman is Sin. Let the Grand Tournament begin. And preparation for the Grand Tournament began as the contestants were ready for combat. Each fought to the death until only one was triumphant. This champion rose to Sin's temple to claim his right to rule the Bloodland. He was never again to be seen. And we're back, continuing our little look at Kronos Digital and their output. Right now we're getting to their biggest hit, which is Fear Effect. It was released in 2000 in North America and Europe and published by Eidos. Eidos? Oh, yeah, I don't Eidos, know how to pronounce Eidos. it. Eidos I'm going to say Eidos. Eidos. Okay, Eidos. Uh, and this was also exclusively for the PlayStation 1. So along with Cardinal Sin, it seems like this is this has kind of become their home. Um, so Fear Effect... I'll just give a quick rundown of what it is if people aren't familiar with it. So basically, features unshaded characters textured similar to cell shading, which is a fancy way of saying they're using cell shading mm -hmm. technology to kind of create 3D models uh, that look kind of like anime characters look like cartoon characters and this wasn't i this wasn't specifically new i don't, I don't think they were the first people to do it or anything but again mm -hmm. coming from chronos's pedigree kind of makes sense um fear effect is basically i mean if you want to really boil it down it's a resident evil clone mm -hmm. uh you know yeah. which which was super popular at the time uh survival horror type gameplay has tank controls yep. has has fixed cinematic cameras in this case, it even has letterboxing, and I'm not sure it... I never felt like it got in the way yeah. of it. I felt like it just lent itself to the cinematic presentation. I don't know if it's if it's because of technical constraints, kind of the way um, the um, uh, Evil Within did it. Yeah. If you guys right. remember when the Evil Within first came yes, out, it had actually. this brutal letterbox, <laughs> and they said it was to make it more cinematic, but it wasn't. It was because it ran like... <laughs> garbage um which they then removed so i don't know if it was that or not i couldn't really get any indication of it but um one thing i kind of want to give uh special mm -hmm. attention to was the pre-rendered backgrounds let, that they used now we're no stranger to pre-rendered backgrounds again a lot of resident evil clones had them uh 3d models walking on pre-rendered uh 2d backgrounds but in this case the yeah. environments were actually looping fmvs so basically it kind of gave it more mm -hmm. texture, more of a, a feeling that it was alive, more atmosphere. Sometimes it was real simple. But in the yep. case of the first stage, it was like, oh, man, we're on these massive skyscrapers and we're seeing all these flying cars driving around uh, at, on the lower floors. So yeah, that was cool. the big like Hong Kong sort of yes. like the big sign that mm -hmm. changes yeah. like the color of the sweet. letters and stuff. Mm -hmm. That looks sick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I mean, we're already kind of getting into some of its main cinematic influences, like cyberpunk and Ghost in the Shell, Blade Runner kind of stuff. Um, I think the other thing that it did, and this was one of the first games to do this, was they actually had some sections where the, uh, the cinematic camera would actually pan in the pre-rendered background, which... I can only think of a couple other games that mm -hmm. have done this offhand. I know Parasite Eve 2 did in its origin in its introduction section where uh Aya is walking across the street and it does this crazy pan and it's kind of choppy. Yeah. But at the same time, for the time, it was nuts. It was just bananas. Yeah. Like you're watching it happen and you were like, oh my God. Um, so that's so that's cool. Again, all of this kind of makes sense when you think of Kronos's pedigree and what they've been up to before. Uh, the game was four discs, which is huge. Well, gigantic. Um, it's massive. It's massive, especially when you think that it's a survival horror game. It's not a full. Uh, it's not a full JRPG or anything like that. It's a survival well, horror game. It's thing. about four hours long. 
Yeah, that's that's what I was going to say is the review I was watching is like, oh, yeah, this game could probably be like six hours, but it has four discs. Yeah. <laughs> that's like, what the fuck? Huge, huge. That's a selling feature as far as I'm concerned. I mean, oh, yeah. yeah. At the time, absolutely. And if you break down the price per disc, you're fucking making a killing exactly, over Exactly, yeah. It's true. Um, also kind of akin to survival horror games of the time had some quick time, like events. It was almost like a cinematic platformer in that regard. There was some trial Mm. and error, instant death traps kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, lots of puzzles. They did. I remember them doing a really, a pretty good job at making it. So all of the clues were in the environment and things like that. It wasn't so much like check notes and, you know, read stuff like that. It was more actual stuff in the environment to kind of keep the pace moving. There was still a lot of adventure game logic, a lot of just kind Mm -hmm. of ridiculous logic sometimes to solving the puzzles. But for the most part, it was all kind of what we call diegetic, like all stuff in the world, which is kind of neat. Yeah. In the game, you control three characters, obviously one at a time. And it rotates sometimes even chronologically out of order. So sometimes you'll skip over to one character that's playing something before something you've already played with another character. And as you can kind of see, all of this stuff is already making us think of Tarantino and Blade Runner and Ghost in the Shell and all these sort of cinematic influences which was no mistake all of it was Mm -hmm. very expressly intense all of this stuff had been in stanley lou's mind uh for a couple years according to him he had kind of planned out a lot of this stuff in the kind of game he wanted to make yeah i mean to to sum up the game kind of briefly you play as three mercenaries uh each with their own sorted pasts and basically they're trying to kidnap and hold a powerful triad's daughter for ransom so hannah deke and glass hannah is kind of the badass femme fatale with a gun uh deke is the sort of psycho loose cannon with two sawed off shotguns uh for weapons and glass is the burnt out ex-military kind of mercenary guy and Mm -hmm. Basically, everything just goes literally to Chinese hell in a handbasket uh, as they go from wanting to kind of make some money to just getting out of this alive to basically <laughs> trying to, you know, save the world from evil Chinese demons and prophecies. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's great. It's fantastic. I mean, if it's not apparent already, I love this game. It's kind of really important to me. Not perfect. <laughs> not perfect. But uh, <laughs> but I love it. Um A couple things that kind of set it apart from Resident Evil also was that you could actually move and shoot and attack at the Mm. same time. There was dual or single wield weapons, which was cool. Combat was still very clunky and uh, you had rolling that you could do to get some iframes, but it was still pretty clunky. Why it was clunky, we'll get to that in a sec. But (laughs) um, I think the other thing that it added to the table on top of some of the other stuff we just mentioned was there was a dedicated stealth system uh, that you could actually you could completely break the game if you knew what you were doing, especially in the first in the first disc. You can absolutely break the level if you know exactly where the AI is looking, where their vision cones are, um, and if you know where they're going to spawn. You can Mm -hmm. blitz through the entire level, just kind of crouch walking around and hitting people with a knife in the back it's pretty sick gotta gotta mention though the areas as far as the stealth is concerned the areas where there are multiple soldiers Mm -hmm. if you knife one in the back he like he cries out in pain before dying oh yeah and then the other soldier (laughs) who's like 10 feet away it's just kind of like, and he just oh, yeah, he yeah. doesn't hear anything. And then you go stealth kill him too. It's you know, <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. So one of my one of one of my favorite things, and this is emblematic of some uh, other. Uh, this is emblematic of Kronos' approach to making a statement to kind of getting people's attention. Is one of the gimmicks in the game was that it measures your character's fear. And your health bar was basically similar to this EKG uh, meter that would get more rapid as, you know, action picked up and as your life was going down. And even at the time, I thought it was cool, but I was like, I don't really understand how this works. Like it's speed. It's it's like sometimes it speeds up when there's danger. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it like is green. But it's going really fast. Sometimes it's red, but it's going slow. What does that mean? Like it, 
basically it's just a health bar ignore all that stuff it doesn't actually mean anything it doesn't actually no, mean anything. It means there's nothing. no there's no there's no like there's no uh consequences to this it's not like eternal darkness where if you get to a certain level of fear compared to your life there's some kind of impact nothing happens it's a life bar just don't worry about it don't worry about it yeah um the game sold well and was critically praised but a lot of people criticize the clunky controls, including me. And this is kind of where it gets interesting. So if either of you guys have played this, you might know how you actually cycle through your inventory. And yeah. Paul and Paul's <laughs> nodding. And Paul, oh, Paul, I saw how you did Paul, it. And I was take like, it away. Mm-mm, take it away. It's, take it away, it's Paul. brutal, man. Like, I, I get what Stanley Liu was thinking, right? Yeah. And, and he says as much. Like, in the interviews, he's like, look, I don't want people to stop in order to select items because he feels like that ruins the immersion. But the other thing that ruins immersion is when you're getting iced by enemies because you're (laughs) hand-handedly flipping through your inventory trying to get the right weapon. Yeah. Like, you gotta... And other games have certainly improved on this over time, uh, but the method they chose where you scroll through a list is... That was an unfortunate choice. I don't I don't know how much blame to put on them for that because we were still yeah. kind of a ways of way a ways away from hotkeys and like holding one button and then hitting a direction in order to select yeah. like preloaded weapons and items and stuff like that. So it's like Yeah. Can I blame them for for not innovating? Maybe? I don't know. But it didn't yeah. work. It it definitely very clunky and quite frustrating. It's and this might be like a a problem that's not real and maybe it's just in my brain. Um, but I also I find it very concerning when the conceit of the game is like, oh, you're fucking badass motherfucker McGee over here. Yeah. Uh, but also we're increasing the tension by making you like fumble around your inventory, and it's like. Well, which one is it? Yeah. Like, yeah. am I supposed yeah. to be this, like, super cool fucking kill machine? Yeah. Or am I supposed to be some jagoff that, like, can't tell his fucking handgun from his elbow or some shit? You know what I mean? And like, this is why Silent Hill works. Yeah. Because yes, you're exactly. Just, you're just playing everyman Harry Mason. Yes. And he's clumsily wielding a pipe and moving around yeah. in weird ways. Mm-hmm. Similar to how I would probably if I was faced exactly. with demons and so on, right? Except that mm-hmm. he doesn't soil his pants like i probably would <laughs> it's funny but for something like fear effects i i agree with you arnie yeah that's not not yeah. a good look what's really interesting though and this is jumping ahead a little bit but what's funny is that part of the problem is they bombard you with items and weapons mm-hmm. yeah. and weapons so it's almost like they're going look at all the options you got you got uzis you got magnums you got <laughs> rocket launchers you got and i'm like dude i just need a gun i just need a gun and you're just like cycling through it so to be to be clear how you cycle through it like like paul's saying is that you tap the square and circle buttons to go left mm-hmm. and right in a radial type way flipping through but the thing is is you don't see the whole radial. You just see yeah. the option that's there. Um, I know I'm not oh, explaining God, it right, I but if you saw that. it, if you saw it, you'd know exactly what we meant. Yeah. You would know exactly. What so we basically, meant. you don't know which way is faster to go. Yeah. Like, do I go right? Do I go left? Yeah. Like, and then if you go the wrong way, you're just fucking cycling through the whole yeah. thing and yeah. it's, to get to the thing you want. And and that's what I think is so funny is that it's almost like they're like, yeah, but look at all the guns we give you. And I'm like, yeah, I know that's part of the problem. <laughs> like part of the problem is <laughs> I'm cycling through all the guns, you know? So even when I'm good at the game, I'm losing because I might not want to use the grenade launcher, but I'm like, oh, I just switched to it because it's the fastest thing. Boom. You know? Yeah. Um. So I kind of like that you brought up, uh, I, I did want to read, I, I like that you brought up with St- Stan Liu talking to journalists at the time and in interviews, because I kind of wanted to bring up a quote that I really, really like about their philosophy, his and, and Kronos's philosophy on Fear Effect. So he was quoted mm. as saying, I wanted players to experience the game through being the characters on screen. In order to achieve that goal, I realized that the fundamental approach to create Fear Effect had to be drastically different. 
Instead of altering proven Hollywood formulas, we simply followed them precisely, which is yes. the part that I find really yeah. interesting. We decided yeah. that it is okay to take control away from the player and seamlessly put them in a story mode, to dictate to the player which character's role he will assume at any given time, not to have a life bar, to tell the player where to use an item in their inventory without having them pixel fishing the entire screen. Not to have an inventory system that pauses the game because it would break the suspension of disbelief. Debatable. Um, Debatable. <laughs> I strongly, I strongly believe that content must take precedence above all else. And don't get me wrong, this is a bo- this is kind of a box quote kind of thing. But at the same yeah. time, yeah. I think there's a lot of really interesting ideas here that. Again, not not necessarily unique to Stan Lee or Kronos, but it is part of their legacy and it is part of what makes their games, especially the Fear Effect titles, really special and really stand mm-hmm. out. And, you know, there are all kinds of gamers and some gamers, you know, and, and I and we all like all kinds of games. It's not like we just like stuff that's auteured and or we just like stuff that gives you full freedom. But I applaud and I respect a lot when someone is like, I am designing a directed experience for you. You know, I, I play games for immersion and for atmosphere and whether I have control or not, sometimes that depends. And for me, Mm -hmm. that's what I play it for. And that's why these games mean a lot to me. And I think that's why they meant a lot to a lot of people. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was kind of wondering what your, if you, if you guys had sort of take on that and like what, how you, how you more feel about it. Cause to me, this is definitely like what he quotes here. This is my jam. Like these are my favorite kinds of games <laughs> tend to be games like this that yeah. are taking me on a ride, you know, that it's immersive. And sometimes I have varying levels of freedom, but I like the idea of, of uh, a studio or a person having this really unique vision and wanting to, to kind of suck me into this story. Um, how do Absolutely. you guys feel? Paul, how do you feel about it? I, I agree. Like open world is great to a point like you are sacrificing certain things and Mm. generally what you're sacrificing is tight storytelling and if the storytelling is good and in fear effect it's okay you know there's some kind of hokey kind of cliched stuff it's a late 90s game or sorry 2000 actually i think for this one so you know it's not going to be super triple a uh storyline here but with that said yeah it's it's tight it's good and frankly this is the game that chronos should have been making for years yes like when yeah. when you look at fear effect and then you look at the trilogy of terror <laughs> like what is going on there why yeah. aren't they making fear effect all this goddamn time <laughs> yeah. like yeah. this is clearly yeah. what they have always been good at yeah. right take away the the whole fighting game mechanics that require precise control and tight gameplay give them something like fear effect where frankly it's just not that much of a requirement like it has tank controls which even by then were kind of out of vogue Mm -hmm. so but like it just looks so good and it's such a tight experience and very unique like you one could argue that the fear effect games are the best looking games on the ps1 period you know Mm -hmm. like they look phenomenal yeah so yeah i I think this is the game that they should have always been making Mm -hmm. it's too bad that they came out so late in the system's life cycle like fear effect still like you said mike it sold well and even though Mm -hmm. we had the dreamcast already out which was making ps1 games generally look bad yeah but fear effect even still was able to hold up i think even compared to you know some of the dreamcast offerings that were oh yeah it it can't be discounted. The atmosphere that they created through the audio as well and the music and the diegetic sound, like it's it's kind of unreal. It really there really there really was kind of a maturity and a nuance to it. And if there and there's definitely some giggling to be had there because there's sure. obvious there's some things about the game that are not mature and nuanced and mm-hmm. that are silly <laughs> and eye rolly as we're gonna get into, but there still was this element, especially in the first one, the opening cinematic and the conversation between – if people want to watch that, it's it's fascinating. The opening cinematic, they yeah. they nail it. They nail the opening every yeah. time. I mean, what, am, what are we even saying? We've been saying that the whole time. Yeah. Um, they just nail it. The vibe, the mood, it feels like you're about to watch an anime. 
and yeah. Yeah. The, the conversation the two characters are having is quick it's succinct it has character they both have personalities they're both likable but at the same time you kind of get an edge from both of them and it's it's fantastic mm-hmm. it's great Arnie, did yeah. you, um, what, what are your experiences with this game? Or actually, I was curious, like when it comes to a more auteur kind of experience versus a more open-ended one, like are you into stuff that's more atmospheric, kind of like this, more driven? or? It depends on the type of game. Like it, it, the problem is that I feel like op- being open world works for specific types of games, specific genres of games. And the fact that we're seeing it like sort of sort of, ham-fistedly like put into as many games as possible now yeah just doesn't it just doesn't work like when it works it works when it doesn't work it really doesn't work and it makes games like bloated and slow and it's true nigh unplayable so when i see something like this where a creator really has like a very specific vision for something i'm like fuck yes this gets me excited because i realize now that i'm playing something that somebody has like very much put effort into making play a very specific way and tweaked it to look and sound and feel a very specific way. Like, I agree with Paul. You can definitely see that this was the game that, you know, Stanley wanted to be making the whole time. You could see it when you play Trilogy of Terror. Like, the cinematics, the, like, insane storylines, like, all the, the, like, effort being put into, like, all these characters and all this stuff that, like, for a fighting game, like, you kind of don't care most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. It really just goes to show that like he should have just been doing this. Yeah. And like where it really shines through is like, you can see his background in film, TV animation, like really come through in something like this. And the thing that holds him back every single time is the fact that it's a video game (laughs) (laughs) and you have to fucking make, make it play. Right. Um, but like, who the fuck would make a four disc, like PS one game for a six hour game? Only this man who wants to create like some insane interactive sort of movie experience, Mm -hmm. but the gameplay always trips him up. Yep. And in fear effect, I think it's the closest he ever got. Um, but even then, like, you know, making it so the canonical ending is tied to the hardest difficulty in the game, like. Why the fuck would you do that? Like that kind of to me, that kind of goes against what you're talking about. Right, it really does. Want people to just have this experience and like see it through to the end. Why would you tie it to like some shit that a lot of people probably aren't willing to do? It's a good point. Um, It's a good point. The fact that like the bosses are also like pre-rendered background uh fmvs that loop over and over again and like if you don't know how to fight them we'll just annihilate yeah, you instantly true. why the fuck would you do that yeah, the bo- to be um, fair that that's that's kind of a boss fight in most games where you yes, where you get to the true. boss and they ice you immediately and then you just kind of yes. learn right but yeah. i i do i do get what you're saying the boss fights can be a, a little bit of an issue uh, personally yeah. where i where i stopped playing it way back in in the day mm-hmm. was the puzzles yeah i yeah you know like it's not that the puzzles were bad it's that i'm bad and (laughs) i was playing a lot of pc fps's and if i got stuck even in the most basic part of a ps1 game i would just drop it and go play tribes right yeah yeah Yeah. but but ultimately like yeah fear effect is really the first game from the studio where you're like oh this is it. Like the pieces yeah. have finally clicked yes, for them. Yes. And they're fucking like, if they just refine and refine and refine, like they're going to get to a point where they're going to really bring something spectacular. I, I mean, I remember, we'll, we'll see what happens yeah. in the future, but <laughs> yeah, no, it's, and I, and I have to say, like, I, I like the way you put that Arnie, because just to, to put in my own little piece, like mm-hmm. it was like wildfire, man, when this came out, it was like a bomb. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It got everybody's attention. Everybody, you know, because of the way it looked, because of the presentation, because frankly, as as batitude and as edgy as things were at the time, this game pushes things. Like there there yeah. are some moments, yep. and it's funny because it's not the moments that people remember or bring up. There's some moments in this game that people don't talk about, and there it's really violent and it's really dark, and it's kind of pretty mature for its time now again i'm not saying it's 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 like some avant-garde art you know arty farty piece in its <laughs> depiction of nuance but you know the fact that glass has his arm cut off you know halfway through the game 
Yeah. And you play the rest of the game. Sorry, spoiler. You play the rest of the game with one arm. It's kind of like, oh, OK. You know, like, I guess we're really doing this. You know, there's. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. Yeah, there's just there's those moments. And I think, you know, because I remember I remember exactly where I was when I first saw Fear Effect to reminisce for a sec. I was at my friend's house uh, and it was like March break from my for my mm-hmm. undergrad year at McGill. And I saw this game. He was like, you have to see this game. And I was watching it and it was like everything I ever wanted was in one game. I couldn't <laughs> I couldn't believe it was real. I was like, this, this is, is this real? Like I can buy this right yeah. now. He's like, yeah, man. And I got it and, and just never looked back. Now, yeah, it's time to kind of get to the elephant in the room, though. Um, so some of you who know about Fear Effect and the series, as soon as I said it, I, I guarantee there's people out there who already are thinking, oh, you mean that game with a yes. So we're, we're finally <laughs> going to talk about it. And it's going to it's going to kind of lead into Fear Effect 2 because it was part of Fear Effect 2's ad campaign. Okay, mm-hmm. so this is kind of the elephant in the room. So, from Me Puppet, we already knew Kronos were no stranger to amping the sexuality in their games. In fact, the advertisements I found for Me Puppet are so much worse. They're awful. Yeah. Like, they're bad. <laughs> like, just flat out, I would be embarrassed. Like, I, yeah, you know, are, even, not great. even at the time, if I, I, I would be like, mom, just no, please don't look at the ad, please. I would be so <laughs> embarrassed. I mean, marketers of the world, I have a rule of thumb for you. Yes. Do not talk about menstrual cycles in your ads unless you're selling tampons <laughs> or pads. Yes, please. Can we, can we agree on that? Thank you. Oh God. I mean, it's, it's so cringy. It's really bad. It's really bad. And I mean, granted, this was the age of suck it down, but at the same time, come on. Like it's, it's really, it's poor taste. And (sighs) thankfully what's interesting is that fear effect one actually didn't have that bad of an ad campaign. I mean, no. sure, Han- Hannah was kind of sexualized. You can kind of see a little yeah. bit of cleavage in her model on, on the on the box art and in the ads. But she's wearing, you know, she's fully clothed. Other than that, doing a badass jumping, you know, like in Hot Fuzz, doing a badass, you know, which should tell oh, yeah. you how egregious it was yes. before that we're like, well, she is fully clothed, ladies and gentlemen. I like, know progress has been <laughs> exactly. Made. That's I mean, you're touching on something. You're touching on something that's hilarious to me, but it, it's. I'm jumping ahead, but it's like people go, oh, Fear Effect, that's the one with the boobs and everything. And I go, well, actually, it's kind of weirdly progressive in some ways, but in other ways, <laughs> and, you know, and it's I feel awful. It's just not a leg I can stand on, even if there is some truth to it, you know, yeah. and you, you probably could have. Yeah. If Fear Effect 2 had never come out. Yes. Because <laughs> yes. Fear so, Effect 1 is not that bad. No. Like, I mean, look, it has a shower scene. Yeah. But like, yeah. can you name an anime that was released from 1997 to 2001 that <laughs> yeah. didn't have a shower scene? Like, it yeah. was just this thing that was there. Mm-hmm. And I'm not necessarily condoning it, but yeah. they all did it. So to point yeah. a finger at Fear Effect and say, bad, 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 it's like, eh. Yeah. You know, Lest you we of... forget Street Fighter Two, the movie. Yeah. Oh my God. Exactly. <laughs> right. And and you know we had Lara Croft already for yes. years at this point. So yeah. it's not like it, it's not like sexy women didn't exist yeah. in media. It's yeah. just that when Fear Effect Two rolls around, it becomes mm. yeah. So turn that shit up to eleven. Yeah. My friend. Yeah. And uh, I mean, thankfully not twelve like Me Puppet was, but <laughs> and actually, I do think uh, it's just pretty to, close. Yeah, I know it's pretty close. Yeah. Like just to just to sort of say to continue on that, Paul. I like that point you brought up because that's something that Lou, when asked about it, because of course you know Lou and Kronos they managed to cast off the shadow of Criticom. Okay, finally, and the yeah. and the trilogy of terror, and now but now this is their legacy. Now this is the thing thing that everyone's asking them about and to lose credit i mean i also think as we'll see i I have some problems with how lou kind of responded to it but to lose credit he was like i really don't see what the big deal is like there's stuff out there that's you know a lot worse you know than and again we're i'm talking specifically about fear effect one i'm not i'm not talking about two yet and the ad campaign for two because as we said two is yeah well yeah let's just get to it so basically um in Fear Effect 2, 
they had double page spreads of the two female main characters, Hannah and Rain, in kind of suggestive positions, showing off a lot of skin, alongside such glorious copy as no one's surprised this story is capable of 13 climaxes. Oh, dear. And I'm like, what? What? You know, so I'm just... Did it get a you know? You know th- sometimes, Mike, I I look at my life <laughs> and I think of all the things I have to do to make a good amount of money, right? right? Like, like you know, and I just think, what a world it would be if I could just what I'm assuming is be up at like two in the morning, drinking some sort of alcohol and being like, I've got it, yeah. <laughs> And write this, yeah, and have somebody like not only green light it, but be like, "Let me sign this check for you right yeah. here." Wait, wait a second, guys. So they're both they're both assassins, right? Yo, they put the ass in assassin. No, not a, not a, not a joke. Not a joke. That's actually uh, one of the ads. Actually, one of the yeah, ads. So it's like... just now. To be fair. Um, number one, to be fair, it got attention as gross and cringy as it is, but it did get yeah, attention. Well, yeah. Um, number two, to be fair, Stan Lou was, you know, it wasn't his call. It wasn't strictly their call. It was up to IDOS, EDOS, uh, and, and Sony. Yeah. Uh, what a perfect partner and, for them in IDOS. Yeah. Considering it's true. Uh, where tr- Tomb Raider yes, was. It's yeah. true. It's true. And so to be fair, he was like, Hey, look. I'm just happy we got any attention at all. I'm happy we got any marketing. Um, and But he was like, you know, kind of wish that they had focused on some other stuff. Because the thing is, this Fear Effect 1 did. Fear Effect 1, the yeah. ads, again, like I said before, the ad campaign for Fear Effect 1 is not like that. You know, it it's much more, yeah, sure, it's more typically what you'd expect from a survival horror game. But still, you know, that was their highest selling game and they didn't need any of that. So no. it's just kind yeah. of it's odd. It's it's sort of odd. I have to imagine he was just so happy to not be making fighting games yeah. anymore. <laughs> probably true. It's probably true. <laughs> he was just like fucking anything not to go back to that. And I mean I don't care, man. Fourteen yeah. climaxes, yeah. twenty climaxes. <laughs> yeah. Let's just, yeah, whatever. No more Criticom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I you know, I think that the last thing I want to say is that, you know, Stanley Lou, um, you know, I do want to, I'm not going to mince words on this. I am sort of disappointed in kind of reading some interviews about it. Now, to be fair, he kind of plays softball when people are asking mm-hmm. him about this whole thing, and especially in 2 and about some of the suggestive stuff that happens in 2. There's a sequence in 2 where you find Rain, who's been kidnapped, and there's some kind of mechanical bug that is strapped to her in a really sensitive area, I'll just say. And it just mm-hmm. looks, it's its very evocative, sure, but it's also just, it's really uncomfortable. Now, she's not getting hurt, and she seems fine, mm-hmm. but it's still just really, it's really not cool. And basically, you know, Lou's kind of answer to this was that, well, people should interpret it in their own way. Um, and it was designed by his wife, so, you know, people shouldn't have any problems with that. Now, again, I'm not saying that... My best friend is a woman, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I'm not saying, now to be clear, I'm not saying like, cancel this guy, you know, and I'm not saying, yeah, yeah, and I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. or any of that. And I know, you know, I know that it was a different time. You know, it was a different time for developers. They had to play yeah. a little more softball with press and stuff like that. They couldn't, yeah. you know, there wasn't, the rhetoric hadn't evolved yet, you know, with that stuff. It wasn't mm-hmm. something to get into anyway, but it is a bit of a bummer. Again, it's it's not something I'd hold personally against him or anybody at Kronos, obviously as if I even knew them, but you know, it's, it's a bit of a bummer and it, it deserves to be mentioned because I think that it's unfortunately, this is kind of Kronos's legacy and it's, yeah, it it kind of is. I I hate to say it. Yeah. I mean, because fear effect was such a great game and then two, like, God damn it, guys, if you just kind of, if, if you just kind of kept the one shower scene again and yeah. didn't do anything else, yeah. I, th- I think we'd be okay. I think we'd be okay. Yeah. But yeah. like, there's the, there's the bug strap. There's, and there's more, man. Like Fear Effect 2 is way more sexual yeah. than the first one. There's, like, yeah. you know, there's so much, there's so much 
poorly written innuendo between the two main female leads yeah, who are yeah. also lovers. Yes. Which, yeah. like, on one hand, you could look at as progressive. Yeah. And mm-hmm. that's great. And it would be if they weren't unclothed with each other so often. Yeah. Because then you kind of take away that progressiveness and turn it into more of, more of a voyeurish, you know... Exploitative. Exploitative. Yeah. That's the word, Arnie. Thank you. Well, and the problem being that, like, you know, if it was just the ad campaign... And the game was like straightforward, very like actiony, whatever. You could be like, oh, okay, yeah, this was definitely like a like a sort of publishing decision, blah blah. Yeah. But the fact that it carries through into the game, you're like, all right, dude. Well, now I like know. this part, you definitely had a hand. In. Like, I don't know, you know what you want me to tell you. Like, the dude, thing. there's one scene where Hannah, she's her and her and Rain, I think were were naked or close to it. I can't quite remember, but Hannah puts on a green dress that is painted on, right? And and Rain says to her, like, <laughs> wow, that dress, like, you might as well be naked. And then Hannah's like, well, if I was naked, I'd only be able to hide one gun instead of two. Oh, my God. And I'm like, Jesus. what does that even mean? <laughs> like, what are we even what are we even suggesting here? It's oh. so it's so brutal, man. Yeah. Like, yeah. And uh, guys, guys. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's funny because like. It's you did mention the progressive aspect before, and it's true because it's true to some extent because the relationship does have moments where they sort of seriously care about each other. Like there's moments in the story where they so they show really genuine non-sexual affection and concern for each other. And so you're like, yeah, great. But then, like you said, the rest of it is just encased in this weird exploitative, you know, teenage fantasy about these two femme fatales with guns. Mm -hmm. And so it just ends up, no matter how you slice it, you just, you don't have a great leg to stand on. It's kind of thin if you want to sort of defend it from that. And that's why, I mean, even to this day, you know, if someone's talking about Fear Effect, I'm like, man, I love those games. But it's so hard for me to, to kind of I'm not going to shout it from the rafters, I guess is what I'm saying, because there's a moment of like, mm, OK, you know, I I do want to point out one one kind of other thing that I think is interesting, because we did already sort of touch on, you know, the ad campaign, obviously, and, you know, uh, and, and kind of Kronos's legacy with it. I, I did like one element of the interview where because, again, it does kind of put some things in perspective, but, you know, slippery slope. I love mm-hmm. how Lou brought up Zone of Enders, and he basically was like, what's the big deal? Zone of Enders, the, the cockpit's in the crotch, and that gets erect when they blast off. And I was like, yeah, all right, <laughs> fair point on that one, Stan. I mean, that's... Listen, I, I'll, I'll give him credit for that, Yeah, but Hideo Kojima is not the guy you want to be like, see, he's fucking doing it. He, <laughs> that's true. You see? This is my moral yeah. paragon right here. <laughs> it's true. When it comes to sexuality in oh, video games. So oh, good. Man. So and also, good. and also, it's just like the classic, like when I'm in when I'm eight years old and I'm in trouble because my brother made me do <laughs> yeah, something. Yeah. Well, he did it too. He, he did it too. Like, Come yeah. on, man. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. It's so it's it's not great. Made me laugh. <laughs> um, but uh, it's funny. Do you? But I mean, here's the funny thing: is that did it actually did it help sales? You know, did it help sales? Well, the answer is kinda. You know, Fear Effect 2 did not sell as well as Fear Effect 1. Now, there there could be a bunch of reasons for that. One of them chiefly being, obviously, that it was very late in the PlayStation lifespan, like yeah. Paul already mentioned. This came out in 2001, exclusively on the PlayStation, again published by IDOS. I mean, so a year isn't a long time in terms of development time, because it came out only a year later. So it was kind of a given that gameplay-wise, it would be pretty much the same thing. There's yeah. just to give it a little bit of uh, just to delve actually into the content of Fear Effect 2, we probably should. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty much the same thing. They added a couple weapons, some non lethal takedowns, some sort of quieter things that spoke more to the stealth stuff, uh, disguises mm-hmm. and things like that. Um, I do think objectively, Fear Effect 2 is a better game. Um, if you sort of just look objectively at it, it's refined. But in terms of, like we've been pointing out already, in terms of the atmosphere, in terms of how, how the story is presented and how much better it kind of holds up from a from a thematic standpoint and from atmosphere and immersion, I think one is the way to go. 
I think, yeah. you know, out of, mm-hmm. out of the two. I think one is great. We should mention that two is a prequel. If every, if anybody wants to play it, uh, don't sweat it because I actually checked. It doesn't spoil anything in the uh, first game. So feel free to play the second one first if you only want to play one. Um, and before we kind of, before I get any takes from you guys on Fear Effect 2, uh, I wanted to just share my favorite part of the game. Okay, you guys will allow me this honor and stream will allow me this <laughs> honor. So there's a part, okay, in Fear Effect 2 at the beginning of the game where you are given, this isn't a spoiler because it literally happens in the opening cinematic, which again, <laughs> by the way, by the way, top notch, Kronos, you know, there you go. Um, so a character named Jin, who's your handler, gives you your mission briefing. And, uh, and Paul, I don't know why I'm asking because I know you'll say no and not do it. But you can always put like a cool Mission Impossible soundtrack as I read this. Okay, so uh, <laughs> everybody in the stream, everybody in the stream or everybody listening right now, take notes because there is going to be a quiz. I'm just kidding. There's no quiz. Okay, here we go. Now listen carefully. I'm only going over this once. Tonight is the annual Christmas formal at the Wing Chun campus. I thought it would be more fun if you crashed the party. There are four sets of DNA sequences scattered in different labs on the 86th floor of the South Tower. You'll be stealing them. Check the package. You'll find two flash disks and two very expensive forged invitation bracelets that will get you girls into the shindig. The first disc contains a genetic sequence that's missing the four sets of links that you'll be taking from Wing Chun. The other disc uh, is a hunter program encoded to seek out the surveillance system access codes for the 80th and 86th floor. You'll need to go to the 80th floor to bypass the security system on the 86th floor. And the only way to have free access on the 80th floor is to create a loop in the surveillance video at the central security hub in their basement. Rain will need to take care of the elevator access there as well. The key card that will get Rain into Wing Chun's basement is inside a package I hid in the sculpture garden. The only way into the garden undetected is through the underground <laughs> aqueduct system. It bypasses all their electronic checkpoints. Find the district utility maintenance hub in the aqueducts and have Rain hack for the access codes. Finally, just get a hair and some fingerprints of Dr. Liu at the party. He should be easy to spot. Just look for the richest man on the planet. You need his fingerprints to gain access to the high security levels via the elevator. Then he uses hair and prints to issue a genetic key card from the security analyst lab on the 86th floor. There is a package for you in the east elevator shaft, the usual goodies. Just enjoy the party. Also, you don't get an exit plan for 15%, but how's this? Try going out the front door. Okay, did you get all that? <laughs> this is like clear as day this is, dude this is like if there was a metal gear codec that like opens up and the fucking guy's just like snake if raiden gets on a train <laughs> headed eastbound <laughs> 77 miles an hour yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just so a couple a couple notes one you never hear this again you never know you never <laughs> Okay, sorry, Artie. Go ahead. Go ahead, Artie. No, I just is Doctor Lou. Is that supposed to be Stanley Lou? I he put himself in the game. I I think so. I left out. <laughs> I this is what's crazy, guys. I left out some of the lines. I Are you actually. Going to say? <laughs> I guess he would have been here all day otherwise. Because there's little bits of banter between them as they go. And I cut those parts out. And you think you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. He literally Jin literally says it this fast. And the first time I played it, I was like, what what the what okay, well I'm sure he's gonna tell me that later. No, never, never. You never get like (laughs) every part of the game. Now, to be fair, it's a fairly linear game. There's not tons to do in every, you know, it is a Resident Evil clone. But Still, I love this and I have to believe I have to believe it was on purpose because it's just it's ridiculous. Like I still can't (laughs) keep track of it. I played the game through like all the way through like eight times. I know what to do. I've memorized it, but I still don't know. Like if you ask me, okay, what are you doing now? I'd be like, I'm going to this room to do that puzzle. Okay, what part of that is that in this paragraph? I have no idea. You're giving you're giving Kronos a lot of credit, dude, man. This yeah. is this is the same house that made Cardinal Sin. I'm not assuming I'm not assuming they did anything. Oh, on you're purpose. right. You're right. You're right. It is pretty fast. I love there's a line where I think it was on purpose with Dr. Liu because there's a line where he says, you know, right after he says the line, look for the richest guy on the planet, you think, yo, Stan. 
calm down a little bit. <laughs> um, but then Glad he has such a humble opinion. Of but himself. then right away, right away, um, Jin goes. Uh, he's like, uh, I, you know, like I think the guy's full of cow do though. Like he says, he's full of cow do, <laughs> like cow doo doo. And I was like, it's okay, so funny right, with that's, these that's, old with the games from this era where I like. Know. There are a lot of games where the swearing is often and vulgar and unpoetic, yep. Yep. right? Like yep. Scarface, the movie, lots and lots of swearing, but it makes sense. Yep. And I never feel dirty listening to it. Video games from this era, though, there are a lot of there's a lot of profanity that just doesn't make me feel good listening right. to. Right. Yeah. Just listen to the intro of Meat Puppet. <laughs> The intro of Meep Up is fucked up, man. I just swear <laughs> With that as I said, said it. this is a great opportunity for some profanity to be put in. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Yeah. You, know, you got to spice it in like a nice seasoning. You just, nope. A little bit over here. A yeah. Little bit over yeah. There. The the you know the the poop. This, no, we can yeah. we can we can change that one up. <laughs> no. So the last um before we take sort of a final break and kind of do our little final thoughts, um there is one more Fear Effect game, kind of. Uh, Fear Effect 2 was the last official Kronos developed and fully published title. It was the last one. Um, it didn't sell too well. And like we already mentioned, kind of late in the PlayStation's lifetime. Um, but they did initially secure a deal with IDOS to make the next Fear Effect game. And that was going to be for the PS2. And it was called Fear Effect God. 3 Inferno. So yeah. fuck, man. kind of the ad campaign would have lit the world yeah, on fire. Would have been totally insane. <laughs> um, so first seen at E3 2002. Uh, similar. I'm not. I'm not gonna lie and say that. Oh my god, it looked totally different. It basically just looked like a PS2 version of Fear <laughs> Effect. Uh, and by the way, that's awesome. And I would have played it yeah. in a heartbeat. And I was super looking forward to it. Um, and there's little bits. If you look online, you can find little bits about what the story was gonna be. Apparently, and and by the way, if you think that. <laughs> If you think that Stan and Kronos kind of learned their lesson and maybe they didn't want to push it a little bit, oh boy, you did not. Because if what's <laughs> online is if what's online is the indication, then they were working, they were gonna try to work in some kind of love triangle between Rain and Hannah and Glass. And obviously your mind runs rampant with where they would go with that. But, um, you know, similar to the first two games, I'd like to think that that would only be like a super small part of it and then the rest would be okay, but who knows. Um, but it did look like the gameplay was going to be similar. Uh, it looks like they updated some of the mechanics because there were, there were demos of it available at, uh, at some sort of preview stations, but just really not too much. And basically people were saying that it was kind of like Fear Effect 1 and 2, but there was sort of more robust kind of cover and diving mechanics. This was still well before pop and, pop and shoot shooters, though. So it was probably still yeah. really rough, you know, like holding a, you know, holding a button like 10 shoot to sort of flatten yourself against a wall kind of thing. Um, but it looked like, you know, still fixed camera angles, still pre-render backgrounds with FMVs. Uh, still the letterboxing, still the same kind of cell shading effects and everything. It was just going to be a uh, fear effect on PS2. And then it just got canceled. That was that. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting. The story behind the cancellation, obviously hope is sprung eternal with hardcore fans that, you know, the code or a beta or something is eventually going to come out. Um, I've read lots of different stories online. There's there's posts from people saying, oh, God, it was actually awful. And IDOS dropped it because <laughs> it was bad and nobody liked wow. the demo. And there are other people saying that, no, you know, it was like 90 percent complete. It was like virtually almost gold and it just got dropped. There's even I this is my personally favorite rumor, although, again, not saying this is true. It's just kind of fun to think about and also dunk on, you know, the house of Lara. But, you know, some people say that it was part of the, you know, the whole Angel of Darkness fallout with Angel of Darkness needing more and more and more resources <laughs> and IDOS taking more and more resources from Legacy of Kane, Anachronox, Gex. I mean, Gex. Won't someone think of Gex? But, oh. um, 
Poor Legacy of Kane. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Poor Anachronox. That was, that was a good Anachronox game too. Good game too. Yeah. Anachronox yeah. is a good game too. And so, and that's the thing. And but again, there's Thankfully, no uh, Angel of Darkness was a massive super <laughs> yes. hit, and they fucking <laughs> exactly nailed it. Thank, thank God. Um, but that's all. Again, that's all hearsay. I'm just putting that in there because it's fun to dunk, and it's uh, it's fun. There's no. Let me be clear for the legal team. There's no actual evidence of that <laughs> is being a thing. The The official story is just, Eidos didn't like it. They didn't like where it was going. And they were like, nah. And that was that. Because the fact is, is they did shop it around to other publishers and no one bit. Yeah. And to be fair, if your game was almost done and no one bit at that point, I don't know. It's it. Shame it's on not, Victor Kai. Yeah. If they were still around back then. Yeah, I know. We needed Victor not, Kai back. Yeah. Not one last ride, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you guys have you, did you guys see anything about Inferno at the time? Were you like me, just rabidly excited or anything? No, 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 no. No, sadly, sadly not. I I like Fear Effect One was a big deal. Yeah. I, I enjoyed what I did play, even though I didn't finish it. Fear Effect Two, a victim of when it was published, you know, two thousand one, a game that looks exactly the same as the one in two thousand. Yep. It's it you can you can just tell it's not going to do very well. Yeah. And by that point, I was completely off the wagon. I, I hadn't heard anything about Fear Effect Three. <laughs> that said, you know, a little bit sad it never saw the light of day. I think it would have been. Yeah. Ah, uh, you know what, man? It probably would have been critically panned. Like if if we're still going with the tank controls for Fear Effect Three in the PS2 yeah. era, it's probably not going to go over well with critics. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's for the best. Yeah. Mike's disagreeing. <laughs> What? Oh no no no! You you want your fair factory? I'm glad I, that Stanley got to make these two games. Yeah, I'll say yeah. that. I'm glad that he at least didn't end his run on fucking Cardinal Sin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, exactly. I would have loved. I mean, I would have loved to have Fear Effect Three Inferno, but at the same time, you know, I'm I'm at the point now where I'm like, maybe it's just maybe it's okay. Maybe it's okay that yeah. you know we're never gonna get it. And that, you know, it's always just going to be something that might have been um, because before we take another break um, and I'm just going to mention this as I spit on the ground um, as this just the dregs that we're, I'm going to go over because I feel like I have to um, because some people might be wondering, hey, wait a minute. You know, wasn't there another fear effect that came out a couple of years ago? And I would say, no, I don't know what you're talking about, because if you're referring to fear effect Sedna. That's not a fear effect game. It's a piece of crap. Don't play it. <laughs> I, I know. I, I just flipped the tone. You guys are like, yo, man, this this. I'd this like just to take this opportunity to mention that this game is isometric, and therefore I was correct. Yes. It's bad. <laughs> um, but yeah, Fear Effect Sedna, just for people who might be curious, Fear Effect Sedna was released digitally in 2018 on PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. It was a French studio, obviously made much later, part of the Square Enix Collective. They got funded uh, via Kickstarter. Um, it's an isometric game. It's terrible. I don't want to talk about it any more than I already have. Uh, but for the sake of posterity and for completion, I will. And some people might also have heard of they are doing a Fear Effect Reinvented, which is a remake of the first game. Uh, same team. There hasn't really been any major updates on that for now going over like a couple years or so. But apparently the, the Discord still is active and they're sharing stuff like concept art and things like that, which is obviously a couple years in, not a great sign. So I'm assuming yeah. that's yeah, gonna be yeah. I'm assuming that's gonna be vaporware anyway. Um but well, yeah. I was gonna say, I don't even think we need to take a break. I think we can just wrap it up here, yeah. Oh, all right, okay, let's do it. So in an interview with Stanley Lou, and I know we've already talked touched about this, but just to kind of wrap it in a nice bow. Um, Stanley said, uh, when all is said and done, uh, how would you like the history of video games to remember Fear Effect and Kronos Digital? And his answer was, I would like history to remember the Fear Effect series as the first true interactive movie that didn't suck and Kronos <laughs> to be the one developer dumb and naive enough to even take on the attempt in the first place. And I'll give him to that. me, it's bittersweet. I think it's a nice thing to say, and as a fan, I agree with it. Um, but like we've already talked about, you know, I'm not sure that's what their legacy is. It's not the first thing that people think of. And, no. um, 
you know, and this is this is where I bring the party down, but don't worry, I'm gonna bring the party back up. So, you know, Stanley Lou passed away uh, in 2017. Um, he had cancer. Uh, fuck oh. cancer. Yeah, fuck cancer. And you know, by all accounts, seemed like a pretty cool guy. Made a lot of things happen. Um, if you look online, you can find YouTube videos of people on their last days and at certain days of Kronos. Uh, hanging out with him, chatting with him. And it seems like, you know, he created a cool digital house, you know, where people kind of made the games they wanted to make. And that's kind of why I wanted to do this. You know, it it started as me wanting to talk about Fear Effect and all this stuff, but um, which obviously we did. But at the same time, you know, it's it's highlighting a bit more of the human angle of this stuff, the, the warts and yeah. all of People who, you know, again, six months, six months, man, you know, they made Critic Common six months, never made a PlayStation <laughs> yep. one game before. And it just, it's a crazy story and it was crazy the whole time through. And I can just imagine it was a hell of a ride. So rest in peace, Stanley Lou. I'm sure a lot of people really appreciated what you did. And I certainly did. Um, so on that note, though, to bring it back up a little bit, what Kronos game that we've talked about now, that you maybe have not tried, if I put a gun to your head, you would play. Or, you know, that you actually want to try. Because I'll, I'll just start. It's me Puppet. That's it. It's over. I want to play me Puppet <laughs> so bad. I want to play so bad. What about you, Paul? What are you thinking? Criticom. Criticom. There's no question. Yeah. There's no There's no question. <laughs> like, again, I, I wish I had this, those these sensibilities back then. Because back then... It was good games. It was good games all day long. We couldn't waste our time with bad games. Now that I'm older, I can appreciate a terrible game like Criticom. If <laughs> just for the comedy value, I love when friends come over to my place and we kind of whet our appetites for good games by playing something really bad and, and get <laughs> some laughs. And uh, yeah, yeah, Criticom, I, I would definitely go for that one. Arnie, what about you? Uh, I want to say Meat Puppet, but because it's isometric, it's automatically disqualified. It's uh, <laughs> that's fair. It's Cardinal Sin, but it's the Saturn port. I want to play exclusively the Saturn port yes. of Cardinal Sin. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. There, there is no Saturn port of Cardinal Sin, is there? No, what, there is a Saturn there? port of Cardinal Critic Sin. There was oh, was it Criticom that got the exclusive Saturn? Criticom port got in the North America. Yeah, Criticom. Criticom. And that's the one I want to play. I want to play Criticom on the Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Oh, that's fair. Poor Sega Saturn. Yep. Well, so the door closes on another episode of Region Free Gamers, the podcast Fluid in Gaming. I want to thank Paul and Arnie for coming on this ride with me, graciously allowing me into their fold, by the way. Oh, man, I didn't even mention that this was my first time hosting. So thank you for being That's so right. gentle. Thank you for being so gentle. I didn't even me. mention how fucking cool the Kronos logo is. It is pretty sick. Top tier logo. It's pretty sick. That's a yeah. cool logo. Um, we especially want to thank listeners, patrons, and our Twitch pals for tuning in. We hope you guys enjoyed it. And let us know on the Discord. Um, if you want to hear more, uh, if you like what you heard, you want to hear more, again, five-star review on Apple Podcasts is a huge solid for us. And there's over 100 past episodes available there for you to sink your teeth into. You can keep mm. track of all of our shenanigans on social media using our link tree. One more time, that's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Region Free Gamers. You can chat with us on our Discord channel. You can meet other great people. And if you fancy being generous, we do have a Patreon with some great perks at affordable tiers. Well, that's it. So thanks again, guys. Thank you, listeners. Thank you. Uh, stay safe. Take care out there. And for the love of God, don't play Fear Effect Sedna. Just <laughs> don't. I, I don't even know why I brought it up. I, I hate myself right now. <laughs>